Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Well Read. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Well, we're in the final stretch of the 2020 campaign, with just days to go before the final day of voting, November 3rd. More than 50 million people have already voted. Way more than at this point in 2016, of course. But there are similarities to 2016 as well. The polls showed Hillary Clinton leading Donald Trump, just like they show Joe Biden leading Trump right now. Trump world's whole Hunter Biden scandal has failed to stick to Joe Biden, and the sham narrative is now unraveling. They hyped up this Wall Street Journal expose, but it turns out they found out that Joe Biden didn't do anything wrong. Meanwhile, Giuliani won't even turn over Hunter's supposed laptop to the media. If this story were true, he would want them to have it and report about it. It's not working. It's not going to take down Biden like the email scandal took down Clinton. But it's all they've got. It is also very telling that, that Trump is publicly pressuring his attorney general, Bill Barr, to go along with his corrupt, politically motivated scheme to indict Biden, Obama, Clinton, and others, and that Barr is not doing so. That's because there's nothing there. The charges are bogus. If there was even a hint of impropriety, we all know full well that Barr would go after them. He traveled the world looking for evidence of democratic wrongdoing, but found nothing. He would have had U.S. Attorney John Durham's report released before the election if there was any wrongdoing, but that's not going to happen now because they've got nothing. Trump has made it known that Barr might not be Attorney General after Election Day if he doesn't act, but Barr knows something that Trump does not. America is not a totalitarian country where you can make up fake charges against your political opponents just to gin up negative sentiment towards them in order to win an election. Not yet, anyway. Bill Barr is basically a crypto fascist these days. His belief in the ultimate power of the president is anathema to what the founding fathers intended and what the American Revolution was all about. His religious zealotry and ideology is scary and dangerous for those who believe in the separation of church and state in this country. He is bent over backwards to protect Trump and his cronies by undermining the results of the Mueller report, by dropping the charges against Michael Flynn, who had already pleaded guilty, by reducing the sentence of Roger Stone, by dropping charges against Russian companies for meddling in the election, by ordering law enforcement to violently clear Lafayette Square in front of the White House in the spring so that Trump could wave around a prop Bible in front of a church for a political photo op, and many other examples. That he won't go along with Trump and the rest of Trump world's scheme to indict Biden and others tells you all you need to know. It tells you that Trump is flailing around, trying to find something, anything that can politically damage Biden. They're flogging a dead horse with this Hunter Biden story, which they've been trying for two years to get the American people to care about, but only diehard Trump supporters give a shit about that. Hundreds of intelligence and national security officials have said that the story reeks of Russian active measures propaganda. New York Post reporters who wrote the story didn't want their name in the byline. Fox News passed on the, on the story originally before uh, uh, making it the only thing they talked about for days after it was published. Even if it were true, which there's no indication that it is, it is absolutely no reason to give Trump a second term so he can solidify his destruction of American norms, democratic institutions, international alliances, and our democracy itself. This Hunter Biden thing is the only play they have left. They certainly can't tout Trump's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. He couldn't even keep himself safe from the virus, and he's the most protected person on the planet. Now he's out there saying he's immune and holding crowded rally after crowded rally, denouncing scientists and epidemiologists. We're living in the twilight zone. If Trump wins legitimately, which I guess includes if he wins the Electoral College, but if so, that's going to have to go as soon as possible, then he and his enablers and cronies and even supporters the ones who want to shove their guns in everyone's faces and plot to kidnap a democratically elected governor and think anti-fascist protesters are somehow the bad guys and the white supremacists are the good guys, will feel more emboldened than ever. The chaos of the last four years will seem like the Ford administration compared to what's to come. And make no mistake about it, a Trump win is absolutely within the realm of possibility. 538 gives him a 12% chance of winning, but that ain't zero not when the stakes are as high as they are. He had a 30% chance in 2016 against Clinton. So the polls are mostly good for Biden, but new voter registrations look better for Republicans than Democrats in swing states such as Florida. Not to mention that delays from the post office could delay vote counting, massive voter suppression efforts by Republicans across the country, and the fact that Russia is still interfering in our elections. This race isn't over. Biden supporters must not get complacent. I'm seeing far too much confidence that Biden has this in the bag. He does not. 
His own campaign manager said, this race is a lot closer than many people think, like a lot closer. But if Trump wins illegitimately, meaning Republicans pull what many fear they will pull and file lawsuits to stop vote counting if it goes beyond election night, which it almost undoubtedly will due to more mail-in voting due to the pandemic, which will go to the Supreme Court, where Republicans just hypocritically pack the court in a rush with the religious fanatics so they can vote to steal the election for Trump, then we're going to be in a very a dangerous moment in this country. A fully authoritarian America is uncharted territory for us, and we just have no idea what will happen or where it will lead us. With ridiculous conspiracy theories like QAnon now cemented in the mainstream, every rationally minded person needs to brace themselves for madness and lunacy in our society like we've never seen before. Even if Biden does win, the 63 Supreme Court majority alone will prevent any lasting progressive change and will indeed roll back many gains we've made. We're entering an extremely scary and depressing era, no matter who wins on November 3rd. Even if Trump loses, Trumpism isn't going anywhere. First of all, the man himself could be back to run for re-election again in 2024. Nothing stopping him from doing that. Or he'll start a rival network to Fox called Trump TV. We can't put the toothpaste back in the tube at this point. But either way, we must plug the holes in our laws and political institutions. Norms need to become rules with consequences. Get rid of the Justice Department memo that says a sitting president cannot be indicted. With that, he's essentially above the law. Clarify when the president can order troops to clash with peaceful and domestic protesters. Strengthen consequences for violating the Hatch Act, which bans political use of uh, government resources. Think Trump delivering his Republican National Convention acceptance speech on the White House lawn. Strengthen consequences for ignoring congressional subpoenas. Think the second article of impeachment against Trump because he ordered his underlings to ignore or subvert subpoenas to testify or provide documents. Strengthen oversight of the intelligence community. Think Trump's firing of FBI Director James Comey in an effort to end the Russia investigation and his many attempts to fire special counsel Robert Mueller. The blog Just Security is in the midst of releasing a series called The Good Governance Papers, a series of essays exploring actionable legislative and administrative proposals to restore and promote nonpartisan principles of good government, public integrity, and the rule of law. Those essays cover a lot of the things that need to be fixed in our government. We must also rebuild the State Department, practically from the ground up. It was decimated under Rex Tillerson and made entirely irrelevant and overtly political under Mike Pompeo. Some of the nation's most talented diplomats and foreign service officers are gone, their institutional knowledge and their international relationships along with them. The diminishment of U.S. standing in the world and its soft power is one of the sadder consequences of the Trump presidency. At first, the world laughed at us. Now, they pity us. It's simply embarrassing. If Biden wins, we can get to work because the pandemic is still raging. We're entering the third and biggest wave as we get closer to winter, exactly where we didn't want to be. People are hurting financially, and yet Mitch McConnell told the White House not to make a deal with Democrats about a relief bill before the election. Across the United States, more than 220,000 people have died but the true death toll is likely much higher than that. The CDC reported that 300,000 more people have died this year compared to a typical year. The only way out of this, which we've always known, is mass testing with immediate results, continued social distancing, and a critical mass of people wearing masks. Even a vaccine, which is not even itself a guarantee, won't completely resolve the situation. And several vaccine trials have been halted in recent weeks because people have been falling ill or otherwise getting hurt. A vaccine won't be widely available and distributed to the American public till mid next year at the earliest. Even then, it will need to be distributed to a critical mass of the rest of the world before we can all go on vacation again. There's no sugarcoating this. No matter how tired you are of the pandemic, it's still here. We're in this for the long haul. Some people are going to unfortunately have to learn that the hard way, as many already have. One final note. We must all keep our eyes and ears open through, during, and after the election. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment for Americans. Our country needs us. On that happy note, how about a moment of levity? Let's check in with our senior influencer correspondent, Brad the Influencer. Bradford? Hey everybody, it's Brad. Um, so everybody's having a hard time figuring out what to do with themselves and how to get through all this 
Well, something that's been helping me out is just having a hard, stiff drink. So um, let me show you what I've been putting together. Um, I cutely call it a quarantini because it's a t it's a type of martini, I guess. Um, so let's see. I start with making my own hand sanitizer, which I just mix equal parts aloe vera gel, isopropyl alcohol, and then I bless it with some of my um, healing crystals. So let me just put a shot of that in there. Just get it really good. And then take whatever your favorite seltzer water is and just fill it up to about right there. I don't know how much that is. I can't tell you. But um, I also have some essential oils here. This one is Ylang Ylang. I have no idea what it does, but let's put that in there. And then we'll top it off with a nice little vitamin C. We'll take a sip. Hope that influenced you. Let's patch in our guest, Dr. Terrence Roberts. Dr. Roberts, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. In 1957, three years after the Supreme Court declared uh, segregated schools unconstitutional in Brown versus Board of Education, nine African-American students were enrolled in the previously whites only Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. One of those nine students was our guest, Terrence Roberts, now a management consultant and author who has lived in Pasadena for more than 30 years. The students were initially prevented from entering the school by hordes of angry racist protesters and the Arkansas National Guard, which was deployed by Governor Orville Faubus. President Dwight Eisenhower had to call in federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine into the school. Dr. Roberts completed his junior year at Little Rock Central, then moved to LA where he graduated from high school and received a bachelor's in sociology at Cal State LA, a master's in social welfare from UCLA, and a PhD in psychology from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. He has been a member of the Pacific Union College faculty, the director of mental health at St. Helena Hospital and Health Center, assistant dean in the UCLA School of Social Welfare, and served as core faculty and co-chair of the Master of Arts in Psychology program at Antioch University, Los Angeles. He founded his own management consulting firm, Terrence Roberts Consulting, as well as an organization with his wife, Rita, called Roberts and Roberts LLC, which is dedicated to helping foster racial dialogues in communities, schools, churches, and businesses. He has written two books, a memoir about his experience in 1957 called Lessons from Little Rock, and Reflections on Community, Social Responsibility, and Welfare called Simple Not Easy. So Dr. Roberts, tell us about your experience as one of the Little Rock Nine. How old were you? What did that feel like? Did, did you know you, that you were at the center of this national story unfolding around you? Well, we certainly didn't know that the story was going to be as big as it became. But I was a 15 year old junior in 1957 and I had volunteered to become part of this experiment. I was actually one of a large group of volunteers. We were about 150 strong, but because of uh, parental fear that we might be killed, most of the parents said no. Only 10 sets of parents said yes. So for a very brief time, we were in the Little Rock 10. That lasted about one day. Afterwards, the uh, group of nine of us showed up and we were of course turned away from school. We were out of school for about three weeks prior to the president sending in the 101st Airborne Division to take us in. Now that was not the, the end of our troubles. Uh, in fact, you might say that was the beginning of the chaos because there was great opposition to our presence. We were not welcomed. In fact, the word was, either you leave voluntarily or we'll kill you and drag you out. Mm. So every day was run uncertain. None of us were certain that we would leave school on our own two feet at any given day. Fortunately, we all made it out alive. And um, eight of us remain alive today. Our numbers are eight, but we are still the Little Rock Nine. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you sort of touch on this, but, but what was it like the rest of the school year when you actually got into the school and started attending classes? Were you ever physically attacked in the school? We were always physically attacked. That was the daily occurrence. That was the order of the day. In fact, uh, my whole goal that year was to stay out of harm's way if possible or avoid getting killed in the midst of some of these encounters. Uh, these folk were very serious about this, and they were determined that they were going to make certain that we did not survive. And I don't know 
to this day how we all survived. I, I can't tell you honestly how we did it. Mm -hmm. uh, we were uh, young, of course, and so youth a lot. When you're young, you can manage to contend with a lot of forces around you without getting too upset. We did, uh, however, go in as nonviolent uh, resistors. We had chosen to be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. I think it would have made absolutely no difference if we had tried violence. In fact, if we tried violence, we probably would have been killed as a consequence. Others could probably yell self-defense or who knows what they might have yelled. Mm -hmm. But we had to uh, really contend with people who were honestly seeking to end our lives on a daily basis. Right. And, and uh, talk to me about your, your consulting firm and, and uh, also uh, Roberts and Roberts and, and uh, talking about race.com. Well, uh, after I retired a few years ago from the practice of psychology, I decided to do consulting primarily based on my reasoning that there are too many people in this country who don't have a true understanding about what's going on in terms of things racial. And that's another reason why my wife and I developed the LLC, uh, Roberts and Roberts, to do work related to things racial. So she and I, she comes from a perspective of, of history. She's a historian and I, the psychologist, we pool our forces and resources to come up with an approach that helps people, one, understand the historical relevance of what goes on currently, because the present is not possible without the past. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, engage people in dialogue primarily, because in my mind, you can't force people to learn anything, but you can engage them in dialogue if they're willing. And somewhere along the way, they can develop enough interest in the need to see for themselves that they might indeed change their way of thinking. They might change the narrative that rolls in their own head 24 seven. The narrative that we tell ourselves in this country, unfortunately, is not a true one. And that's kept us at uh, a point of not really making much progress over the decades. So uh, currently, I'm doing a lot of work on Zoom, of course, because uh, COVID has meant that we don't travel as much. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to groups all over the country. And my point is that we have to really understand the truth about who we are, instead of accepting the false narrative that we learn, unfortunately, at a very early age. And because of that, it takes root. It's very difficult to dissuade people from believing in something that they've learned when they were toddlers. But we try, you know, we keep going and see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this country was basically founded on principles of, of racism. What, what, what can we do about that today? How, how, how can we address that? Well, you know, it's a very interesting thing, Justin, because uh, a lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people don't believe the country was founded on principles of racism, when in fact, it doesn't take much exploration through the historical annals to find proof that this is so. And so we have to scale that mountain first. We have to help people realize that the truth they believe in is not truth at all. It's some sort of uh, linguistic fiction that has helped them develop a narrative that they live by. But in truth, things are swirling around them that they can't even see. I see it uh, present in the conversations I have with people all the time. Mm. They're simply unaware of the racial issues that are, it's like this COVID-19, you know, the pandemic we're going through. A lot of people can't see it. And so they figure it's not really here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same with racism. If people choose not to see it, they're willfully blind, willfully ignorant. And I, you know, I'm still convinced that as we have dialogue, as we continue to help people see the truth, that there's still hope. I was asked not too long ago, perhaps a couple of days ago by a person in the audience on Zoom, are you hopeful? And I said, yes, I am, but I have no way of explaining why I am hopeful, except that I know that the tools we have are significant. And that is, as humans, we, we are animals as humans. We are human animals, but we are higher order animals. And so we have the power to dialogue, to talk, to communicate, and we can change our minds. We can change the way we think. That's an important thing. 
unlike lower animals who are locked in by instinct to a way of living, and for them it's a matter of survival, of course. But for us, it doesn't have to be the same way. We can do things differently if we so choose. So I guess if we were to put this in a nutshell, it would be we want to bring people to the brink of choice, show them what the options are, and then leave it to them to choose to see what is possible. They have to be able to imagine, though. Imagination is very much a part of this whole change business because if you can't imagine the new re reality, it's very difficult to find your way to it. Right. Yeah, and, and this summer we saw a, a large-scale protests in reaction to the police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, many others. Uh, some wondered whether we were witnessing uh, just a moment or a, a lasting movement. So what's your sense on that? And, and has any lasting progress been made? Well, you know, it's been intriguing to me to watch this because historically there have been similar moments. I remember Trayvon Martin, for instance, not that long ago, there was an explosive moment, but subsequent responses were minimized simply because uh, the person who murdered Trayvon Martin was helped by the authorities to walk away from his crime. And I think a lot of people were simply crestfallen at that point, so disappointed that they were unable to do anything by way of sustained movement. But I think the, the murder of uh, George Floyd was televised, videotaped by someone standing there. And that allowed people to see for themselves because this officer was on this man's neck with his knee for a lengthy period of time, even though you could hear him plainly saying, I can't breathe, I need to breathe. And they kept telling him to get in the car. And I thought, how ludicrous, how can he get in the car if you keep your knee on his neck, he can't move. Yeah. And that was such a blatant example, such a cold blooded murder, which was videotaped and then it went viral and people could see it. And I think that awakened the conscience of a lot of people who perhaps heretofore had given not much thought to what was going on. They may have given some expression of concern about what was happening, but not to the extent that we see and hear even now. Uh, initially, there were these great you know, street protests, people in the streets and really voicing their concern. That has abated somewhat, but you still hear about the murder of George Floyd. I'm still hearing people talk about that. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that it had a very lasting uh, impact. Whether it will lead to a movement, I really don't know. I hope so. I truly hope so. Yeah, me too. And, and what are your thoughts on uh, the, uh, the election? Does this feel as, as tumultuous as it did in the 50s and 60s, or is that sort of an apples to oranges comparison? Well, uh, th there are some comparisons, of course, but this one seems a lot more ominous, given what we have seen from the, the man who is occupying the White House right now. He actually told us four years ago who he was and what he probably would do. Not uh, enough people believed him. Well, enough people actually did believe him because he, he literally lost the election by over 3 million votes. It was only because of that insanity of the Electoral College that he sits there now. Uh, that's telling too, and that's important for people to understand. When you look at the historical record, you understand how and why the Electoral College was invented. It was invented to appease slaveholders, and it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed, and so it's still being used as a way of making certain that those who have a, a very pernicious idea about how we should live our lives in terms of being racial beings, and the Electoral College helps to preserve that kind of reality. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a, a movement, <laughs> if you want to think about a movement, we really need a movement to change how we elect people. It would be a very simple thing. We could follow the lead of all the other major countries in the world who do a simple majority vote. That makes so much sense. And yet we have to contend with something that seems almost impossible to change because once you have the power to use that and the power to continue to use it, it won't be given up easily because it pays too many dividends. And we see that now 
in the way that the uh, nominee to the Supreme Court is being handled, mm -hmm. not about finding a person who is judiciously sound and capable, but simply finding somebody who is going to spout the company line and follow along with those who are at the extreme right on that uh, end of the political spectrum. It's an unfortunate reality because not only will we suffer here in this country, but the entire world suffers because of the history that the US has played in global politics. We have a, a big footprint out there on the international stage, but it is quickly being diminished. I don't know if we can recover from some of the things that have happened. Yeah, it's a really scary time for sure. Um, so, so briefly tell us about the books you've written and, and are you working on any new projects or writing anything these days? Well, the, uh, the first book I wrote, Lessons from Little Rock, is essentially a memoir about what actually happened in Little Rock in 1957. Uh, the second book, Simple Not Easy, is a collection of essays really designed to entice or encourage readers to become more active in the uh, civic process, to vote, to run for office, to support candidates, to voice their opinions about who should be elected, et cetera. Uh, I'm currently working on a manuscript. And uh, in fact, uh, this is a very uh, sort of serendipitous. Tomorrow morning, I'm having my first conversation with an agent, a literary agent, about a new manuscript I'm working on. Uh, the working title is Learning to Navigate the Racial Terrain in America, mm. colon, uh, 79 Years of Uncertainty. <laughs> I'm basing that on my own perspective. I will be uh, 79 years old in December. And so uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'll know in the morning if the agent uh, feels that it has some possibilities of publication. If uh, we get the green light, then I will actively start it out. I have a rough draft of a manuscript, but it is uh, in need of work. So that's a project will probably take the next year and a half to complete. We'll see how that goes. Well, fantastic. Well, good luck with that. And um, uh, are you reading anything good these days? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, I'm reading a very fascinating book. It's uh, a biography of a, a man by the name of Alan Locke, who lived in the early 19th century. The title of the book is The New Negro, written by historian Jeffrey Stewart. Hmm. It's a fascinating book because here's a young man who has such a great intellect, but because of the racial situation, was unable to really realize his full potential. Although he did obtain a PhD degree from Harvard University and was able to go to uh, England as a Rhodes Scholar, even during those times, so it tells you quite a bit about what he was able to achieve in spite of those tremendous obstacles. Mm -hmm. And he, he lived in an era where it was very, very difficult for black people to do anything because the law and the custom were so mightily opposed to anything that black people might want to do or thought they were able to do. Hmm. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate your perspective. I really appreciate you coming on and talking about your experience and uh, the, all, all the important work that you've done. Well, thank you, Justin. Good luck with all your projects. Thank you. Okay. All right. Take care. Thank you all for tuning in. If you need recommendations for good reads, check out Dr. Terrence Roberts' two books, as well as the many good political books that are out there right now, including Rage by Bob Woodward, in which Trump told him in January that the coronavirus was airborne and more deadly than the flu, while he was publicly saying the opposite. Where Law Ends by Andrew Weissman, the federal prosecutor who brought down Enron and served as one of Robert Mueller's top prosecutors in the special counsel's office investigating Russian interference in the 2016 election. His book is an absolute must read for anyone who wondered what the fuck and how is this possible? When newly minted Attorney General Bill Barr released a four page memo in March 2019, summarizing and under undermining the findings of the Mueller report. Disloyal by Michael Cohen, Trump's former personal attorney who goes after Trump hard. This is a fascinating inside look at how Trump operates. Melania and Me by Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, 
former friend of Melania Trump until she blamed Wolkoff for the investigation into corruption around the Trump inauguration funds. Compromised by Peter Strzok, the former FBI agent who worked on the Clinton email investigation and the Trump Russia investigation. Hoax by Brian Stelter, which delivers a blistering account of how Fox News controls the messaging and narrative that Trump lives and governs by. Read up before the election. With any luck, they'll be irrelevant after then. Though not really, because we all must learn how this happened so it never happens again. Okay, before we go, let's check in with our senior toddler correspondent, Sienna. Thank you for that report, Sienna. That's it for this episode. Please, everyone, go vote. We're at a tipping point in this country, and we could go either way, a return to normalcy or an unstoppable fall into authoritarianism. It's on all of us now. Do your part. Stay tuned for new episodes and a new season of Well Read soon. You can find this show on YouTube and the Pasadena Media TV channel. Check for showtimes at PasadenaMedia.org or watch it on their streaming app. I'm Justin Chapman, signing off. Learn more about my work at JustinDouglasChapman.com. And remember, a life well read is a life well spent. So go read a book. Till next time. Mm -hmm.